Hello and welcome to Canadian History, the general education elective, and the very first lecture podcast. These podcasts are meant to replicate what we would normally be doing in a face-to-face course. There will be one lecture like this for every unit and week in the course. It's your main way of accessing the content. However, you also have readings, other videos, and projects which will broaden your knowledge of Canadian history. In this course, we will be exploring the rich and exciting history of the country of Canada. Canada today has a population of nearly 38 million people. Our nation is diverse, with two official languages along with thousands of others spoken every day. Its 10 provinces and three territories extend from the Atlantic to the Pacific and northward into the Arctic Ocean, covering almost 10 million square kilometers making Canada the world's second largest country by area. In this course, we'll also see the land before it would be called Canada. We'll learn about the first peoples, the first nations of Canada who arrived here thousands of years ago. We'll learn how these people developed into an incredible variety of indigenous cultures and languages. We'll learn about the first contacts with Europeans and the terrible tragedy of colonization. We'll see Canada grow into a modern nation in the shadow of the British Empire. We'll see the country changed by war and advance onto the world stage in the 20th century. We'll also explore modern Canada and what it means to be Canadian and all of its complexity. Welcome to the course. The learning objectives for this unit are Number one, understand how historians make conclusions about the past. Number two, recognize the difference between primary and secondary sources. Number three, explain the concept of historiography. Number four, identify the geographic, environmental, and climatic regions of Canada. And finally, number five, explain the ways in which these factors have influenced human habitation. So why do we study history? Now, I know none of you came to Sheridan to sign up to become historians. You're all in very interesting programs, and this is an elective for you. But electives are meant to make the world more interesting for you. They're meant to make you a more well-rounded person. Electives like this increase your literacy skills, your ability to do critical thinking and creative thought, and your ability to research. But what is it about history that makes it so important for us as human beings to learn? Now, history has always fascinated me because I love looking at the past. There was a quote by an American author named Michael Crichton. He wasn't a historian, but he said something I think really interesting about the importance of studying history. And here's what he said. He said, if you don't know history, then you don't know anything. You are a leaf that doesn't know that it's part of a tree. History is all around you every single day. It's under your feet. It's in the buildings that you walk through. It's in your family. It's in your face in the mirror. History is literally the roots of everything around you. And it is uh, the basis for the world that we live in today. If you don't know history, then you don't understand where you come from. This is why history makes the world so much more interesting. I often think that before you study history, the world is much more black and white, but suddenly when you study history, it bursts out into vibrant color. This is what makes history such a fascinating subject. Think for a second, how do we know anything about the past? I mean, how do we know anything, anything at all? When you watch a television documentary which talks about ancient Egypt, How does anyone know that any of those things actually happened? If a historian says to you that there were castles and knights in shining armor during the Middle Ages, how do they actually know that? How do we know anything about the past? You've probably learned all sorts of things about history without even realizing it. There's sources that talk about history all around us. 
sources that are in our popular culture. You've probably read a book at least once which took place or had a scene in it which took place sometime in the past and you learned a little bit about that time period as a result. Almost certainly you've seen a movie at one point in time which took place in a past time period. Plenty of television shows are depicting a time period from long ago. Things like Downton Abbey, Mad Men, or even the new popular show Vikings. There are even video games which take place in historical time periods from long ago. All of these are sources which have informed you in some way about the past. Now if you thought about it, you could probably imagine that historians or archaeologists look at even different sources. So maybe they might find old diaries or letters. They might dig through the archives of an old library and find other written documents from people who died long ago, they would teach them something about the past. There's also artifacts, so things that have been dug up out of the ground, left over from people long ago, displayed in museums. Those are things which teach us a little bit about the past. Even the bodies of people who died long ago, their bones can tell us something about the world that they inherited. And of course, most important of all, our teachers. We all learn something about history because of teachers. But are all of these sources equal? Do they all equally tell us about the past? Are they all equally trustworthy? Do they tell us the same things about the past? Does it even matter what type of source we look at about the past? Historians classify all sources, everything from video games, television shows, to old bones, to artifacts, into two different types. This is the fundamental division in history. There are primary sources, and there are secondary sources. Now let's find out what they are. A primary source is anything, anything at all, which was created by humans in the time period you were studying. So that means it's something from the past, some object or document or something that was created by a human being in a past time period. So for example, you could imagine some sort of written document could be a primary source. If it was created in the time period that you're interested in, then it's a primary source. So imagine you were interested in uh, the 1800s. So. Uh, 150 years ago or so, then anything written down by a human being during the 1800s would be a primary source for that time period. How about art or paintings, sculptures? If they were created in the time period that you're interested in, then they tell you something about that time period. They're an expression of a human being who was alive during that time period. In particular, paintings are a window on that time period. Prior to photography, paintings are the only sort of colorful depictions we have of a world which is long gone. Of course, old buildings are also a primary source. If they were created in the time period, the buildings or the ruins that are left over are certainly primary sources. Anything that was made by a human, an artifact, an object, it could be a fork, a fork left over from a couple hundred years ago. If that's the time period that you're interested in studying, then that fork is a primary source. Clothing, if it survives, and, and truth be told, not much clothing survives, it tends to be very perishable, but if it did survive to our time period, then it is a primary source from the past. And there are clothing items that have survived from 200, even 300, even 400 years ago. There are pieces of clothing which survive. So they are certainly primary sources. Literature, poems, anything written down, again, it's a primary source. Even if it's artistic, it's a primary source. It's an expression of the writer uh, who was alive in that time. So their ideas, their feelings are all considered relevant primary sources. 
And of course, anything that's dug up out of the ground from that time period, such as bones or other archaeological remains. All of these are primary sources. Okay, so let's take uh, a specific example. Imagine you wanted to find primary sources for the time period of William Shakespeare. Now, if you've never heard of William Shakespeare, and probably you have, but if you haven't, he was a playwright who lived in London, England in the late 16th, early 17th century. Um, many of you probably encountered uh, him by being forced to read a play that he wrote in high school, in a high school English class. Okay, so say you were interested in Shakespeare's time period. You wanted to learn more about it. What types of primary sources might be relevant? Well, of course, writings, uh, the things that he wrote down, like plays, poems, his sonnets, all of those are certainly primary sources. They teach you a little bit about the time period that he inhabited. It teaches you a little bit about the man, William Shakespeare. But maybe a little bit less obvious, but still very relevant, what about tax records? They're certainly primary sources. They tell us something about the time period. They were created by humans in that time period. How about buildings? Buildings that existed during the time of Shakespeare are certainly primary sources. Paintings? Well, look at the painting that you're looking at right now. It tells you a little bit about what he looked like. Paintings are certainly primary sources. They can tell us all kinds of things, like the types of clothing that people wore, or what the world looked like. Even a hat. If Bill Shakespeare had a hat and it survived, it would be a primary source. If it was created in the time period that we are studying by a human being, then it is a primary source. Okay, so what about secondary sources then? A secondary source is anything that concerns the past but comes afterwards. So it's not something that was created in the past. So an obvious secondary source would be your textbook, or any book for that matter, about history. They may have lots of information about the past, but they aren't primary sources. They weren't created in the past. They were created afterwards. Magazines about history could be a secondary source, or teachers, of course, are secondary sources. TV shows that you watch are secondary sources. Movies are secondary sources. Video games that you might play, all of these are secondary sources. They were not created in the time period that you're studying by humans. They were created much, much later on. They were created in the present time, so therefore they're a secondary source. Wikipedia, of course, is a secondary source. Random internet websites that you find are secondary sources. And even peer-reviewed academic research by professional historians, which is, of course, the most important secondary source, is still a secondary source. Another way to look at the difference between primary and secondary sources is Another way to look at it would be that primary sources are our evidence. They are our clues from the past. They're the only things left over by a long dead people, remnants of a society that has all but disappeared. Now, if primary sources are our evidence, and they are, in fact, our only evidence, they're the only things we have from the past, then by definition, a secondary source must be opinion. Sometimes good opinion, sometimes smart opinion, sometimes well-informed opinion, sometimes crazy opinion, sometimes opinion that's just plain wrong, but opinion nevertheless. All secondary sources, good and bad, are all lumped together as opinion. Okay, so I want to do a thought experiment with you. Imagine for a second that there's been some sort of huge disaster, a nuclear war or a um, some sort of uh, disease or something has wiped out all of civilization on Earth. Everything is gone from our time period. It's completely laid to waste. And a thousand years from now, we imagine there's some new civilization of humans that arises and they somehow rebuild society and there are historians in that future time period and they're interested in our time. But nothing survives from our time until a chance discovery. A chance discovery of these pictures from Tim Hortons Camp Day. Now, if you've never heard of Tim Hortons or Camp Day, uh, Tim Hortons is, of course, a, a nationwide coffee shop chain in Canada. And uh, one day of the year on June 1st, they um, take all the proceeds uh, from their 
um, coffee and it goes towards uh, children's camps where uh, underprivileged children can go to camp for free and have a great time and it's a nice charity and everyone feels good about it so that's what camp day is but let's imagine for a second that this is the only thing that survives these photographs from camp day what could future historians conclude about the past based on these photographs alone think for a moment would they actually know what these children are doing would they know that they were playing or would they know that there was a camp probably not they just see children doing different things they could be training for something this could be an elite group of child warriors or child assassins in the upper right hand corner they might be wearing their military uniforms and in the other left hand corner they could be doing a military salute the kid in the middle looks like he's got his war face on with his you know you know scary grin there's only a few adults in this these pictures perhaps future historians would look at our time period and think wow maybe maybe there wasn't a very long life expectancy and and adults were were very few it was mostly children perhaps they would conclude based on this that we live much closer to nature than we do today because all of the photographs have nature involved in it in some way perhaps they would think that these children are part of some sort of cult that there's a religious ceremony going on all of these would be legitimate hypotheses based on the evidence in front of you there's nothing to say that they wouldn't be correct or couldn't be correct if you had no other information this demonstrates the great difficulty that historians have when they look at primary sources from the past. A primary source doesn't necessarily um, tell you what you want it to tell you. It's just simply survived from a past time period, sometimes by happen chance. It certainly wasn't created with you in mind. It served a purpose in that time period. So when you are looking at primary sources from the past, you have to be very careful when you're interpreting them. You have to allow for many different and sometimes even contradictory hypotheses. And until you have more evidence, you have to simply say, we don't know. And you'd be surprised at how little we actually don't know about past time periods. So what is trustworthy when it comes to a secondary source? So if we grouped what I would consider the trustworthy sources, we would have three different levels of trustworthiness. At the top of the group would be peer-reviewed sources. These are sources which are created by professional historians for other professional historians. They are books and academic journals. They're not generally read by um, most people. It's not meant for the overall general public. These are sources which are highly technical. They're very specific. They use a lot of jargon. They're difficult to read, but they are the highest level of trustworthiness. These sources teach us brand new things about the past. It's where cutting edge research is done about history. The next level down is academic sources. Academic sources we encounter in our coursework. An academic source would be your textbook, for instance, or if you go to the museum, or if you read a historical plaque that's called public history. All of that together, I would call academic sources. And academic sources do have a reasonable amount of trustworthiness. They're often written by professional historians, but they're different from peer-reviewed sources in a few ways. Number one, they're not trying to do anything new. They're not trying to conduct brand new cutting edge research about the past. Instead, they're presenting existing research in a way that the general public can understand. They are also not peer reviewed. And we'll explain what peer review is in a moment. Next down the list would be the history that many of us encounter in our day to day lives called popular history. Popular history can take many different forms. It could take the form of a magazine that is about a historical topic for people who are interested in history, sometimes called history buffs. The type of magazines that you could buy about history that you would find in a chapter's indigo are almost certainly popular history. When you watch a TV documentary about a historical subject, like a documentary on the Discovery Channel about ancient Egypt, or a documentary about World War II that you saw on uh, Remembrance Day on television. Those are all popular history sources. Again, they can sometimes be reasonably trustworthy, and they do sometimes have professional historians helping out on them. 
but they're not the same thing as a textbook. They aren't as trustworthy as a textbook, and certainly not as trustworthy as a peer-reviewed academic source. And there are also trustworthy websites. These are websites that are produced by colleges, universities, museums. They, again, these are popular history sites. There are sites that generally are trustworthy, that generally have good information on them, but they're not quite as trustworthy as an academic source or a peer-reviewed source. Peer-reviewed sources. Peer review is the process used by publishers and editors of academic and scholarly journals to ensure that the articles they publish meet the accepted standards of their discipline. So when a historian publishes something via peer review, they submit the work to a body of experts. Their name is removed from their uh, written work so that no bias can be applied. And the body of experts reviews the work to make sure that it meets minimum standards. They're checking the methodology. They're checking to make sure that the historian has cited all their sources. They make sure that it's the highest level of research. And if it meets that requirement, then it can be published. And only then it can be published. This is called peer review. When a historian submits something to peer review, they're usually doing original research. That means that they are looking at something new for the first time or interpreting something in a new way. Original research is always based on the analysis of primary sources. It's always based on evidence from the past. And as such, original research contributes some new knowledge of the past. So when historians are engaged in original research, they are contributing to our overall understanding of the past. Historiography refers to the history of historical research on a subject. What we know about the past changes over time. This may seem obvious, but what historians wrote about a subject 20, 30 years ago may not have been as informed as what historians are writing about now. People change their opinions. New evidence comes to light. Old ideas are replaced by new ideas. Historiography, therefore, is not about the histor history per se, it's about the historians. So if I talk about the historiography of a given subject, say the historiography of chocolate, I'm not talking about the history of chocolate. I'm talking about how historians who write about chocolate have changed their ideas and changed their opinions over time. That's what historiography means. So historiography is the collective body of knowledge on a given subject. Let me give you an example. Women's history is a subject of history. Now, obviously, women have always had a history, uh, but it may surprise you that almost nothing was written on the subject until about the mid 20th century. The historians of the past didn't deem it to be an interesting subject or something worthy of being written on. So if you went back 100 years ago, you would be very hard pressed to find many books on women's history. Today, however, it's a massive subject with many different historians working on it. Therefore, we would say the historiography of women's history has changed dramatically over the past half century. So now that you have an understanding of how historians do their work, I want to turn now to Canadian history, and we're going to start with geography. Canada is a vast country, and from coast to coast, there are many different geographic and climatic regions. And in those areas, people have had to live very differently and adopt very different strategies for living, depending on geography. If you think about it, geography affects everything of how we live. Canada is a colder climate. Our rhythm of the year is informed by the seasons in which we live in. If you were living in a tropical country closer to the equator where the seasons aren't as important, well then you would have a different lifestyle than we do in Canada. Geography alone does not determine human destiny, but it does pose limits. So if you were living in the high Arctic, for example, where farming is impossible, therefore your society is not going to be based around farming. You're not going to develop a farming culture. Um, geography also then determines population sizes and economy and the mobility of a region. So in regions where food is plentiful or food is easy to grow or there's lots of animals to hunt, well then 
those regions might support larger human populations. In regions where food is scarce and harder to come by, we're more likely to see very small populations. Uh, we'll see populations that might have to move around a lot following herds of animals, or we might see populations that are settled in towns. All of this is dependent on geography. And so the economy, the, the mobility of a society, and our population size is often determined by geography. Geography can also inspire political sp systems and spiritual beliefs. So in regions where um, there are uh, lots of food resources, where you can have a bigger population, we often have more complex societies and more complex political systems. In regions where food is scarce and humans tend to live in very small, small bands, political systems can be much more simple. Perhaps you just have one chief over a small band of people. Spiritual beliefs are also tied in many ways to the climate and to geography. So uh, people that live in the desert are unlikely to have any spiritual beliefs about trees. On the flip side of that, if you live in a forest, very often uh, your spiritual beliefs are going to be tied to the fact that, you know, you are living in a forest and and all of your you know day to day interactions involve that um, environment. The other thing to think about is that geography is not static. Over one human lifetime, of course, geography doesn't change much, but human beings have been around for thousands of years. And in that period of time, geography has changed quite a bit. 10,000, 15,000 years ago, when some of the first people were arriving in the region that we call Canada, the environment was completely different. It was much colder. Canada was in the grip of the last ice age. The entire planet, the northern part of the planet, was covered with a great ice sheet. Yet nowadays, southern Ontario, at least in the summertime anyway, is nice and warm and very pleasant to live in. So geography changes over thousands of years, and so the way people live on the land also changes. So here you see a map of modern Canada, a population density map. So what this means is it's showing you where most people live in the country. So where you see more of the yellow and the red, that's where there's more people living and where you see more gray and darker colors, that's where there's less people living. So when you look at this map, is there anything that stands out to you? Where do people in Canada live? And you'll notice that the vast, vast majority of people live within 100 kilometers of the border of the United States. So if you look at that green line that goes along the bottom of the country of Canada, that is a line which is showing you exactly 100 kilometers from uh, the United States border. So for instance, all of the uh, campuses of Sheridan College are within 100 kilometers of the border of, of the United States. And even when it goes beyond that, it doesn't go overly beyond. The reason why people live in the south is probably fairly obvious. It's the warmest region of Canada. And if we looked at a population density map of Canada thousands of years ago, when the First Nations were living here, um, we would have seen a very similar population density in the sense that the most amount of indigenous people tended to live in southern regions, particularly the region of uh, what is now southern Quebec and southern Ontario right here, and over in uh, British Columbia, what is now British Columbia over here. These were regions where there are really ideal conditions for um, for living. There, the summers are, are mild or, or the winters are mild, the summers are warm, there's plentiful food. Um, in southern Ontario and southern Quebec, there are conditions that are ideal for farming. And so all of this supported very large populations. They support po large populations today and they supported large populations thousands of years in the past. So here's what Canada looked 20,000 years ago. There was a huge ice sheet over the entire country. This is at the height of the last ice age. Um, during the last ice age, it wasn't just Canada, but the entire northern part of the planet was covered by this massive ice sheet. Temperatures all around the world were much, much colder than they are today. In fact, this ice sheet was in some cases a mile high, if you can imagine it. Um, and the entire country as we would know it would have been pretty much covered with this ice because so much of the um, water of the planet was frozen at the time. 
Um, it meant that water levels, ocean levels around the world were much lower than they are today. And in fact, North America was actually connected to Asia at this time period. Uh, a strip of land which is now underwater called Beringia, which you can see in the upper left-hand corner of this map. So I bring this up because if you recall, I was saying that geography is not static. This is actually what uh, Canada looked like when the very first human beings arrived in this region. Um, and the environment that they were coming into is incredibly different than it is today. In fact, where we're living right now, where Sheridan's campuses are, was covered by this massive ice sheet. So that's one of the reasons why humans did not actually get into the region of Ontario until much later, until this ice sheet started to melt. And the ice sheet started to melt around 12 to 10,000 years ago, and it slowly retreated over a few thousand years and eventually disappeared altogether. And when it left, it left an incredible mark on the landscape that we can still see to this day. When the first human beings started to move into the region of Ontario, the region that Sheridan is now, the environment would have been closer to what we would see in the high Arctic. It was far too cold and the ground was frozen too much of the year for there to be much in the way of trees or forest. And the animals that lived during the last ice age were very different as well too. During the last ice age, animals such as the woolly mammoth, which you see here, which is essentially a huge furry elephant, uh, these massive beasts, which are sadly extinct now, uh, roamed all over North America. Um, and we believe that one of the reasons why um, they went extinct was possibly because of overhunting by humans, um, both in the Americas here and in Europe and Asia as well, where mammoths existed too. Um, but also mammoths were partially done in by the changing climate. As the world began to warm up, uh, they were not able to adapt to the new conditions the same way. And these mammoths were roaming in regions that you now um, would uh, be living in around Sheridan College. In fact, all the time we still find um, discoveries of the remnants of mammoths. Uh, so, for example, here are the partial remains of a woolly mammoth that was found in Michigan near the Canadian border in 2015. So this is just south of really where we are at Sheridan. Um, and there's been discoveries of mammoth bones all over Brampton and Oakville and even downtown Toronto, if you can imagine it. So here's a, a map. I just took this as a, uh, a screenshot from a website which details using Google Maps locations where um, mastodons, which are another another type of mammoth and mammoth remains have been found in southern Ontario. And in fact, you'll notice that there are uh, sites all over downtown Toronto, places that were discovered when they would be digging for the, the uh, subway system. Uh, they found bones then and when they do street work. Um, there's several um, examples that have been found right nearby Davis campus um, at uh, in Brampton as well, up uh, near Steeles Avenue. There are several locations where mammoth bones have been found. And mammoths existed in an environment which is completely foreign to us now in um, southern Ontario in you know the 21st century where it's nice and warm um, summers in fact get super hot a mammoth would have found it unbearable but in the times of the uh, end of the last ice age when when the region that we're living in now was basically like the Arctic um, they found it quite pleasant and this was an ideal environment for them so geography is not static it changes so the Canada that emerged after the last ice age, the Canada that we live in today, is really divided up into six physiographic regions. So what is a physiographic region? A physiographic region is a region of climatic and geographic similarity. That is, the geography and the climate is roughly the same in that area. So the weather would be mostly the same in that area and the, um, uh, the types of plants and animals that you would encounter are mostly the same in that area. And so when we divide up Canada and we look at the history of people living in Canada, they really start to fall into categories based on the physiographic region that they're in because the humans would have to adopt uh, strategies in order to survive and thrive in whatever physiographic region that they're in. So um, Canada is really divided up into six physiographic regions. So going from uh, the east, we have uh, the Atlantic and Gulf region over here. 
the region that we are living in, in um, around Sheridan College, is the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Lowlands. And so this is this region right here down southern Ontario, southern Quebec. Just north of us is the largest physiographic region, which is the Canadian Shield right here. Next to the Canadian Shield is the Interior Plains. Over here on the west coast is the Western Cordillera. And in the north, the far north, is the Arctic. That's the north region up there. So I'm going to go through each of these physiographic regions and just give you a few um, uh, points about what they're like, what it's like to live there, and a little bit about how historically humans have adapted to those different regions. So let's start with the largest physiographic region. Uh, this is the Canadian Shield. Now, the Canadian Shield is huge. It covers um, at least 40% of the um, land area of Canada. And uh, you can get to it uh, from Sheridan College by driving only about an hour or so north. It starts around what you would, might consider cottage country around Huntsville. And it's pretty obvious once you're starting to enter into the Canadian Shield because what you see are lots and lots of rocks. Everywhere there are rocks. The Canadian Shield is in fact made up of this massive amount of Precambrian rock. Now, Precambrian rock is some of the most ancient rock in the world. Um, it was formed when the planet was formed. And as a result, in this area, there are large mineral resources, mineral deposits, and the area has uh, historically been covered by forest. The average temperature um, is not uh, super high, to be honest. It's around 15 to 18 degrees. The terrain tends to be difficult to travel on, at least before we had airplanes or nice highways blasted out of the rock. So historically, you know, large rocks, wetlands, lakes, it's not easily uh, traveled over. Um, the climate is not that suitable for agriculture, particularly the further north that you go into the Canadian Shield. The soil is very rocky and um, up and down, and it's really quite cold. Um, historically, this meant that um, the land was not able to support large, large settlements of human beings. And so um, we see in the past that um, indigenous people who live there tended to live in very small groups, small dispersed populations. Um, and even to this day, human populations in the Canadian Shield are relatively small. This is not where the majority of people in Canada live by a long shot. So that gives you a sense of the Canadian Shield. So now let's turn over to the East Coast to the Atlantic and Gulf regions. So the Atlantic and Gulf regions are, um, if you visit them today, um, it's made up of a lot of rounded hills and plateaus. It is actually the remnants of a mountain system that formed during the Paleozoic era, which is roughly 480 million years ago. Uh, these um, uh, mountains, which are still sometimes called the Appalachian Mountains, which is a, a range that stretches from basically Newfoundland all the way down the east coast of the United States into the southern United States. And nowadays, the Appalachian Mountains, and I'll put them in quotation marks, are not particularly spectacular. They're really just big hills. But at one time, 480 million years ago, they were as tall as the Alps. They were immensely high, but gradually they eroded over time. Uh, in the Atlantic and Gulf region, there are some areas which are suitable to agriculture, but there are very few large fertile areas, so it's not really suitable to widespread agriculture. The climate tended to uh, vary a fair bit. Um, and, and as such, the um, indigenous people who live there often survive more on fishing and game than game meaning hunting game animals, rather than agriculture, which we see in other regions of Canada. There tends to be quite a bit of precipitation on the coast, and this is true still to this day. If you, were, if you watch every winter, the east coast of Canada gets battered by massive amounts of snow, but as you move inland, it gets a bit more dry. The population tended to live on uh, by the ocean and uh, by rivers interior. 
Okay, so we've discussed the Canadian Shield. I've given you a little bit of an idea about the Atlantic and Gulf region, which is sort of the remnants of this ancient mountain range, the Appalachian Mountains. Let's turn now to the area that we're in right now, uh, Sheridan College's area, which is the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Lowlands. So the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Lowlands, which includes southern Ontario and southern Quebec, um, was essentially formed by the retreating ice sheets. So when those big ice sheets that I showed you before, when they melted, um, they um, essentially ground up portions of what used to be the Canadian Shield. And this really enriched the soil. Uh, so if you were to describe the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Lowlands, you'd say that it's dominated by very gentle rolling hills. Um, and it's got very, very large uh, belts of fertile soil. It is really perfect for agriculture, particularly the region of southern Ontario where Sheridan College is situated. Um, traditionally, this area has always been a very good area of the country for agriculture. It's also um, one of the easiest areas to live. Um, the summers are quite warm and nice, and the winters, relatively speaking, by Canadian standards, the winters in this region are very moderate. They don't get particularly cold. Um, and not surprisingly that this is where we saw large populations of Indigenous people living historically. Um, some of the largest um, Indigenous groups lived in this region. We also see the most complex societies living in this region. So there were large um, complex agriculture societies that lived in this region prior to the arrival of Europeans. Uh, this region also has very good transportation networks historically because there's a whole network of lakes and rivers where it's very easy, relatively speaking, to get from one region to another region. Okay, so moving from the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Lowlands, let's now move to the interior of the continent, to the interior plains. The interior plains are the flattest part of Canada. If you've ever driven across the country, once you reach the plains, the, the prairies of Saskatchewan and Manitoba, you hit this region where it is flat for a very long time in your car ride. And it can get very boring if you're driving that far because the landscape just doesn't change for a very long time. Um, this region actually used to be part of an inland sea millions of years ago. And the ground underneath is made up of flat layers of sedimentary rock. That is rock that was formed at the bottom of these seas. Um, so really what you have in this region are very flat, rolling hills a little bit. Um, this region has extremely cold winters and relatively short, cold summers in the north and maybe a little bit more moderate summers in the south. The soil is very good uh, for farming, and, and, and in some cases, it's excellent. Today, this region is, is heavily involved in farming. However, the reason why it's very productive at farming today is because of modern irrigation techniques, because the problem with this uh, area of land is that it is also very dry. Um, there's very little participation, uh, participation like rain in parts, and um, the regular drought severely limited agricultural activity prior to the 19th century, prior to the develop of more, development of more modern farming techniques. Nevertheless, people who lived in this region did have abundant game animals such as bison, which could support fairly um, l large native populations, but those native populations had to be mobile. They tended to follow the herds of animals. And Europeans, when they arrived in this region, really didn't involve themselves in farming until the 19th century either, because it was, it was difficult to get farming going in a region that was so dry. Today, the region has become extremely important because of valuable deposits of oil and gas, which had um, increased growth quite rapidly in the region. However, the falling prices of oil have uh, caused some more recent economic turmoil. So moving um, uh, westward across the country, we'll now talk about the Western Cordillera, the Western Cordillera, which is along the west coast of Canada. The Western Cordillera is, of course, dominated by mountains. There are a series of mountain ranges which extend from North America all the way down through South America. The mountains that run through uh, Canada and the United States are known as the Rocky Mountains, and they are absolutely spectacular if you visit them today. 
However, this mountain range is relatively young. Unlike the Appalachians, which are now just rounded little hills, uh, these are young mountains, and so they're big. Uh, these uh, young mountains basically date from the Cenozoic era, which is around 80 to 50 million years ago. The effect of the mountains is, is that it, uh, it interrupts weather patterns. It means that the climate on one side of the mountains, the climate on the side that is closest to the Pacific Ocean, is warm and wet and mild. However, the mountains are a barrier to that warm, wet weather from getting into the interior plains, which is why the interior plains tend to be colder and drier. Uh, the mountains were also a barrier for contact. So the native cultures, the indigenous cultures on one side of the mountains really were cut off from the indigenous cultures on the other side. However, the temperate coastal, coastal climate on the side with the Pacific Ocean was very good for food. There was um, quite a bit of natural resources such as um, salmon and lots of game animals, and it supported a very large human population. In fact, really, it's second only to the Great Lakes St. St. Lawrence Lowlands in terms of just how easy it is to live there. And thus, the Western Cordillera and the St. Lawrence Lowlands both to Day and historically have had the largest populations of human beings. So now that we've talked about all of the lower physiographic regions, let's now turn to the most extreme physiographic region in Canada, and that is the north. Well, the north of Canada is, of course, very, very cold. Um, it's so cold, in fact, that the ground doesn't entirely thaw out every year, and this makes it impossible for trees to grow. So you see very few trees, there's very little soil, and very long winters. The land is called permafrost. That is what it's called because the land never entirely thaws out, even in the summer. This makes farming uh, pretty much impossible. Historically, only very small concentrations of people in very dispersed groups could survive. And they were able to survive because of natural resources of, of fish and um, game animals that they could hunt, but not in such abundance that would support large populations. Um, and today, the region is also becoming important, like uh, the interior plains, for its deposits of fossil fuels, although this is really only a recent development. So here you see the north in the summertime, and again, there's no trees, and the land is very, very cold. Even in the summer, it doesn't really warm up that much, and the land itself never entirely thaws out. So it's a very difficult place to live in, and it's a very rugged environment, and as such, it never had very large human populations. It was always small populations in the past, and it continues to be a small population to this day. So this is the makeup of the geography of Canada. So in next week, we're going to be looking at how uh, the history of human beings in these regions have been affected by these geographic differences from the Western Cordillera to the North to the Canadian Shield to the Great Lakes, St. Lawrence Lowlands. Every region presents its own opportunities and its own challenges. And so before we end today's lecture podcast, I'm just going to uh, talk really briefly about some conventions of history and dating, which you'll need to know in order to understand um, uh, the readings and also a lot of the rest of the history that we'll be talking about in the course. And finally, a quick note about dating systems used in history and how we'll use dating systems in this course. Many of you might be familiar with the old dating system, which is the AD-BC system. So if we were to say the year that the search engine Google was founded, in our formal way we might say Google was founded in the year 1998 AD. AD stands for Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. It's a Latin phrase. It does not stand for after death, which is a popular misconception. BC stands for before Christ. Now, obviously, this entire dating system um, is a Christian calendar. It's uh, predicated on the idea that A.D., the first year, so year one, starts with the birth of Jesus. And then B.C., we count backwards in time before the birth of Jesus. Uh, the system was developed in the 6th century by monks living in medieval Europe. 
There's been a movement over the past few years for historians to adopt a more neutral dating system, one that reflects that we are not all Christian, um, even if we are all um, using the old Christian calendar. So the new system replaces AD and BC with CE and BCE. So CE becomes Common Era, and BCE becomes Before Common Era. CE equals AD, or BCE equals BC. For the purposes of this course, we'll use CE and BCE. But you should still be familiar with the old system, because you'll find it all over the place still in use. Um, some textbooks still use it, often museums still use it, and sometimes even I will forget and still use it as well.